Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome everybody to this last uh, session of the day. Uh, congratulations to those that, who have made it thus far. And uh, um, thank you for choosing this session. The f competition is fierce. Um, but it's a very interesting topic. Uh, so we are talking here about e-commerce and data transfers from a Latin American perspective. Uh, my name is Nicolas Zingales. I'm a professor of information law at the Fundação Getúlio Vargas in Rio de Janeiro, where I also uh, lead the e-commerce research group. And uh, I'm also uh, a founder and uh, in the organizing committee of CPDP Latam, which is the uh, sister conference of CPDP. Uh, it's a younger sister. Uh, it has now uh, uh, two years and it's turning to its third edition. Uh, and from this information that I'm sharing with you, you can already uh, anticipate that the goal of this session is to bring the Latin American perspective uh, to this discussion. Um, so basically the, the starting point from this discussion is to realize that we have uh, uh, a booming uh, e-commerce uh, in Latin America, particularly with the pandemic. Uh, there was an increase of 38% uh, of the population uh, that uh, make purchase of online. Uh, however, uh, the tech sector uh, is not um, uh, is showing the same increase in terms of uh, GDP uh, share uh, in the economy. Uh, and so the reflection from which we started and we proposed this session uh, was precisely to think about the fact that uh, um, for many technologies that are used in the context of e-commerce, there's a reliance on uh, uh, foreign partners, right? So uh, the, there will be a lot of cloud technologies uh, analytics uh, that is used uh, in the context of e-commerce and that involve uh, data transfers. And so uh, in this perspective, uh, th there are challenges, you know, in terms of uh, how can the providers of uh, these services ensure that the transfers uh, maintain respect for personal data uh, when they are transferred to, when the data is transferred uh, from uh, the Latin American region abroad and also the other way around. Uh, so how can uh, protection of personal data be ensured also for uh, incoming data flows? Uh, so we have uh, an excellent uh, set of speakers uh, from very diverse uh, background and perspectives. And uh, um, we have half of them uh, actually, a little bit more than half online, uh, but we're trying to make the, the, the connection, Brussels to Latin America, as smooth as possible. Um, and we also have a surprise guest for you um, <laughs> that uh, comes directly from uh, Chile uh, to update us on the status of uh, legislation that has been in the making for um, six years now and that uh, has been approved in the parliament and in the Senate and uh, it is, will be uh, approved, you know, the final uh, sanctioning of the bill will be next month. Uh, so we will start with uh, the speech by uh, Leonardo Soto, who is uh, a deputy in, uh, so M MP uh, of Chile, and uh, he was the, one of the proponents and also one of, uh, their, their rapporteur for the bill on data protection law. Uh, so we thought that uh, it would be good to hear this update from him to then uh, kick off our discussion regarding data transfers. Uh, he will speak in Spanish, so for those of you who are not comfortable with that, uh, you can pick up um, the headset there in the back. Uh, so, Mr. Leonardo Soto, the floor is yours. Muchas gracias. Bueno, muy buenas tardes a todos, a todas. Quisiera partir mi, mi ponencia explicando que la revolución que está planteando la Internet, eh, que está cambiando toda la matriz comercial y productiva del planeta, está ocurriendo igualmente en todas partes. También en Chile, al final del, del mapa mundial y también en América Latina. Hoy día, más que nunca, la recopilación, procesamiento y tratamiento de toda clase de datos personales a gran escala fluye sin parar en todas direcciones. 
Esta circulación y acumulación de nuestros datos personales hoy día con un escaso control de las personas, por una parte nos llena a todos de optimismo sobre el futuro, por la prosperidad y el progreso que, que promete, pero al mismo tiempo nos sentimos que pueden existir amenazas potenciales a nuestra convivencia, básicamente por la falta de control sobre su desarrollo y expansión. Por eso en Chile estamos convencidos que es fundamental que globalicemos la confianza entre todos los países para enfrentar este futuro digital, para que el enorme potencial de estas nuevas tecnologías se haga efectivo a favor de las personas y no en contra. En concreto, nosotros entendemos que esta confianza se consigue a través de un marco regulatorio común, con reglas claras y efectivas que protejan los datos personales, pero al mismo tiempo faciliten el libre comercio y la circulación de los flujos de datos. Es ese binomio tan importante que debe fluir, pero siempre a través de reglas claras conocidas por todos. Creemos que la armonización normativa, la convergencia regulatoria entre todos los países es un paso clave, ineludible y además urgente. ¿Está América Latina preparada para este desafío? Nuestra región no quiere ni puede quedar fuera de las enormes oportunidades que está ofreciendo la economía digital. En la actualidad, la sociedad hiperconectada y globalizada reconoce como único obstáculo en nuestra zona que existen modelos normativos regionales y nacionales divergentes, diferentes entre ellos que hoy día pululan en cada lugar de nuestro continente. En consecuencia, para que América Latina se incorpore de lleno a este proceso que está ocurriendo en todo el mundo, es importante que transite en un camino hacia una regulación común o similar. Esta senda, este camino ya comenzó en nuestro continente y se reconocen como señales muy alentadoras la aprobación el año 2017 por la Red Iberoamericana de Protección de Datos de los estándares de protección de datos para los estados iberoamericanos. Así también muchos países en forma aislada están incorporando a nivel doméstico los principios e instituciones de la protección de datos reconocidos internacionalmente, en especial su versión modernizada, y me refiero al convenio denominado 1808 Plus, así como también el RGPD de la Unión Europea, que está pasando a ser, y eso hay que reconocerlo, la nueva regla de oro para la protección de datos a nivel mundial y regional. Destacan en América Latina, Uruguay y Argentina, como los únicos países latinoamericanos que hasta ahora han ratificado el convenio 108 Plus, pero que además son considerados por Europa como países que garantizan un nivel adecuado en la protección de datos personales. Tenemos confianza que en Chile, con nuestra nueva ley de protección de datos, inspirada también en el, en el, en el, en el RGPD, va a seguir el mismo camino que han seguido estas naciones hermanas, siendo el reconocimiento de país adecuado el siguiente paso que queremos dar. ¿Cómo está la protección de datos en Chile? Bueno, Chile aspira a diversificar su economía, convirtiéndose en un centro financiero y también de las tecnologías de la información, así como un centro regional de procesamiento de datos y de servicios basados en la nube. Tenemos algunas ventajas comparativas que nos ayudan, por ejemplo, factores relacionados con nuestra estabilidad económica, política, en nuestro suministro energético, la conectividad y también la infraestructura de telecomunicaciones. Ayuda mucho este dato que para nosotros es del día a día, que Chile es un país completamente abierto e integrado al mundo, que tiene la mayor red de acuerdos comerciales en todo el mundo. Chile ha suscrito 26 tratados de libre comercio con 64 mercados en el mundo, que representan el 63% de la población mundial y el 87% del Producto Interno Bruto Global. Por eso hoy día Chile ha dado un paso importante y como ha dicho Nicolo, eh, Chile se encuentra a punto, a puertas de aprobar una nueva ley que junto con proteger los derechos de las personas y regular su tratamiento, 
crea una nueva agencia estatal independiente con poderes normativos y sancionadores. En, el, en este sentido, esta nueva ley desde el inicio se propuso adoptar el más alto estándar normativo, concretamente el del Reglamento General de Protección de Datos de la Unión Europea. Y en este sentido, nosotros, eh, nosotros agradecemos el apoyo que hemos tenido desde el inicio de parte del equipo de la Comisión Europea que preside Bruno Giancarelli. Y, y, y entre otras, el proyecto de ley, para hacer una breve pasada, trata sobre eh, el tratamiento de Big Data y regula con mayor detalle los datos sensibles, estableciendo nuevos datos como los biométricos y los relativos a perfiles bioquímicos, biológicos, humanos, los utilizados con fines históricos, estadísticos, científicos y otros, así como también los de georreferenciación. En materia de flujo transfronterizo de datos, podemos decir que el proyecto chileno establece una primera gran regla referida a la declaración de adecuación, la que va a corresponder a nuestra Agencia de Protección de Datos. Pero a falta de ella también se contemplan otros mecanismos adicionales que permiten velar, creemos adecuadamente, por el correcto tratamiento de datos que hagan los responsables. Se prevé, por ejemplo, que la agencia pueda aprobar cláusulas contractuales modelo, siempre que contengan garantías similares o mayores a las que establece nuestra ley y que otorguen, y esto es muy importante, derechos exigibles y acciones legales efectivas a los titulares de los datos. Se establece que deben ser incorporadas estas cláusulas contractuales modelo varios principios, derechos y acciones. Por ejemplo, el principio de la finalidad, el principio de la proporcionalidad y también debo destacar que la ley contempla el deber de responsabilidad proactiva del responsable de datos, que obliga a una vigilancia continua y permanente del cumplimiento de nuestra ley en el nivel de protección de los datos personales ya sea que el tratamiento lo realice directamente o también se haga a través de un tercero o mandatario. A este último deber apunta justamente el nivel, el nivel y permanencia de protección que está exigiendo el reglamento europeo, según lo declaró el tribunal, en el, en el caso eh, SCREM 2. En definitiva, podemos ver que Chile avanza con fuerza para ser parte de esta nueva economía digital. Y para ello hemos dado este primer paso hacia una nueva y moderna ley de tratamiento y protección de datos personales, confiando en el más alto estándar normativo existente y uniendo nuestras legislaciones y el futuro digital de nuestros ciudadanos al modelo que propone la Unión Europea. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Leonardo, for this comprehensive overview. Uh, it's good to hear that the Chilean Parliament uh, had the Schrems uh, two judgment in mind, also when uh, drafting this legislation, and that it has um, foreseen a number of instruments facilitating the transfers, um, including contractual instruments. Uh, and this is precisely the, the link that I want to make to our next speaker, um, so we are uh, honored to have uh, with us uh, Miriam Winner, uh, who is uh, a member of the board of directors of the uh, Brazilian Data Protection Authority. Uh, she has been uh, working uh, for, for many years in data protection and she was uh, actively involved in the uh, drafting uh, of the legislation. And she's also now uh, participating in the um, adequacy discussions with the European Union, uh, between Brazil and the European Union. Now, uh, what is interesting is also that the Data Protection Authority has uh, opened a call for inputs uh, by society on uh, um, contractual instruments for data transfers uh, and is expected to regulate, you know, create, uh, shape these instruments uh, with some regulations uh, soon. And so we are very much looking forward to hearing from her um, some of the work that the authority is doing on this. Uh, Miriam, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Nicolo. I'd like to begin by thanking you for the invitation to take part in this discussion. I'm honored to share the floor with so many distinguished speakers. 
And it was really interesting learning about the progress that Chile has been making in this discussion. And I'd like to take a few minutes also to share what we have been doing in Brazil. So as many of you may be aware, Brazil is one of the newcomers uh, between the countries with data protection laws. Our law was approved only in 2018. It came into force in 2020. And we are also a very young DPA. We were formally created in November 2020. So we are now just over two and a half years old. And I think, you know, to come to, to your question, the issue of international data transfers has always been I think very central in our discussions as to how to approach uh, the regulatory scenario in Brazil, because of course we are one among hundreds of countries with data protection laws, and it seemed to us very clear um, the impact that any regulation on international data transfers may have not only on the economy, on the economic insertion of Brazil into these global data flows, but also on the level of protection that data subjects have. And in Brazil, we now have a new fundamental right towards data protection that is formally enshrined in our constitution. This happened only last year, so this is also a recent development. And I think the challenge indeed is how to make sure that Brazil and Brazilian companies can take part of this global digital economy that depends so strongly on international data transfers while maintaining the necessary protection of a fundamental human right as we have here in Brazil. So. Um, I think Chile, the, the representative from Chile was mentioning several different mechanisms. And also in Brazil, our law provides for a portfolio of mechanisms in a manner that is quite similar to what we have in the GDPR. So we have adequacy decisions, we have standard contractual clauses, binding corporate rules, we have the possibility of transferring data to fulfill legal obligations for public policies and so on. And we also have other mechanisms that are based more strongly on the idea of private sector voluntary compliance. So the law also speaks about seals, certificates, codes of conduct. And I think these are mechanisms that are still to a certain level an unfulfilled promise, maybe also in Europe. Um, and of course, we are very much aware of the discussion on the global CBPRs and other similar mechanisms. But I think this is still a topic that needs to be um, a bit further developed in Brazil. So for us as a new DPA, it, it is in fact very challenging to navigate this complex network of international data transfer mechanisms and also to establish priorities considering our own specific circumstances. So we have so many issues to tackle in terms of implementing and enforcing a new legislation. And when we began looking at the issue of international data transfers, um, it seemed to us that it would be uh, more efficient to firstly address the standard contractual clauses and other contractual mechanisms, simply because these mechanisms are sort of off the shelf and they can be used by large companies, by small companies. They provide, in theory, a cost-effective manner in which to enable the data to be transferred while maintaining an adequate level of protection. Um, we are, of course, also with discussions in discussions with the European Commission on future adequacy decisions. And this is something that certainly makes lots of sense to us as a country because our legislation is so strongly inspired by the GDPR. But as a first step, um, our, our decision was to begin discussions on SECs, BCRs, and, and other contractual mechanisms in order to have you know, a first step to allow us to move forward to, to more sophisticated discussions. So I think um, there are some points I'd like to make before giving the floor to the next speaker. And the first one is the importance of cooperation within our region. And I'm really happy to see representatives of other organizations and countries operating in Latin America. Um, I feel that there is lots of potential for cooperation. And I think that also we are a very interesting region in the sense that we are subject to different influences and practices and standards. So, of course, there is a strong European influence. We have countries that already have adequacy decisions. We are also subject to influences from the OECD because we have countries that are members and countries who aspire to be members. We have countries that participate in the APEC CBPR mechanism. Of course, uh, we have countries who are parties to Convention 108. So I think this mix of influences is a, a very interesting regional characteristic. And also, I think it's important to highlight that cooperating within our region, we are able to explore commonalities in terms of historic, economic, and political circumstances that are not always found in other regions of the world. 
Um, a second point um, is that I think there has really to be a, a great effort in terms of seeking interoperability of these different mechanisms. So much is said about harmonization. I think it's it's not really um, feasible to imagine that all countries will have identical legislations, but thinking of how these legislations can work together in order to allow data to flow seamlessly between different jurisdictions while maintaining an adequate level of protection, I think is also very important. There will not be total convergence between our legal frameworks, but it's important to develop these mechanisms that allow us to navigate between different approaches. So what we have done very concretely, um, in Brazil, we are legally re required to have a period of public consultation before issuing regulation. But what we did in this case was to go beyond and before actually having our public consultation on the draft regulation of international data transferred, we had a period where we issued a request for comments. We call this tomada uh, de subsídios in Portuguese. So we, we posed a number of open questions and invited all stakeholders to contribute to help us to better understand what the issues are, what the main difficulties are, and what the best approaches are considering our own specificities. And I think one of the interesting points was, of course, we were discussing, is it better to have SECs or adequacy decisions, which issue should be considered? But the interesting point was that um, besides answering these questions, um, some, some commentators actually brought up new questions that we had not even really considered. For instance, what is an international data transfer? Because there are so many complex situations where, for instance, a Brazilian national might be in Brussels and accessing his network in Brazil through a personal computer. And, and I think this is a debate that has already come up in Europe, of course, but for us, it's also super important in order to identify if an international data transfer is actually taking place and therefore if it is necessary to use one of the mechanisms provided for by the LGPD. So we had this request for comments. We had a number of very valuable and interesting contributions. We also requested input from our advisory board because in Brazil, the DPA uh, is assisted by a consultative council made up of different stakeholders from government, from academia, from civil society, from the business community, from labor unions. Um, and this consultative council actually created a working group to address the issue of international data transfers. And they have also provided us with interesting inputs from different perspectives to enable us to move forward. And our expectation now is to have a public consultation on the draft regulation sometime later this year. I, I would hope to say the first semester, but I, I, I imagine this might be a bit optimistic since we have quite a complex and lengthy decision-making process. But certainly this year, we look forward to a public consultation that will discipline these mechanisms for international data transfers and probably also propose wording for standard contractual clauses. And I'd just like to, to close these opening remarks by saying that throughout this entire work, we have been paying very close attention to what is going on in other jurisdictions. Uh, I realize that there are many different model contractual clauses on the table at this point. We have, for instance, within our region, the Hege Iberoamericana de Protección de Datos has their own model clauses. I believe Pablo Palazzi was one of the main, uh, main persons who was working on this issue. And uh, we have the European SECs, we have Convention 108 SECs and so on. And I think our effort is to figure out how these different models can fit in together in order to make sure that data can flow between countries with trust and while maintaining a necessary level of protection. So thank you very much once again, Nicole. I really look forward to listening to the other speakers. Thank you very much, Miriam. Uh, it's very good, great to hear uh, all these developments uh, and uh, we look forward also to the next steps, uh, particularly given the very interesting questions that were also asked during the consultation. Uh, I think one, uh, you know, as you said, that data transfer, what is a data transfer is already a quite important topic uh, to be addressed. Uh, another one uh, that was mentioned is uh, the uh, scope of intra-group, uh, intra-economic group transfers. Uh, and there are several other, other important issues that were discussed, so we are looking forward to uh, the next consultation. Uh, um, so given that, uh, as you said, there are many influences in the region, uh, the question arises how a, an existing player uh, of e-commerce can deal with all this uh, complexity of uh, different jurisdictions and different uh, proposals 
Uh, so from uh, the policy field, we now move to data protection on the ground. Uh, we have uh, uh, Samantha Oliveira, who is the um, DPO uh, for Mercado Livre, the main marketplace uh, of, in Latin America um, that has presence in multiple jurisdictions. So um, Samantha, thank you very much for being with us. We would like to hear from you, uh, if possible, how you navigate this complexity. Hi folks, good afternoon for everybody. I'd like to start saying thanks to Nico for the kind invitation to participate in this panel. I'd also like to express my joy of sharing this table with these amazing professionals and dear colleagues, especially to you that chose to spend your time listening to me. I hope to contribute and, rely and repay your kindness by sharing some practical insights from the business sector. Mercado Livre is one of the biggest e-commerce platforms in Latin America and whose purpose is to democratize uh, e-commerce and financial services. To provide the service, we rely on eight operations acting across 18 countries with more than 39,000 employees. As you can imagine, we handle a huge amount of data. I want to highlight just some numbers to exemplify that. Our websites receive almost 600 visits per second, and we process 2,010 transactions per second. It's a lot of data from different places and regions. We also need to ensure strong data privacy standards to make our ecosystem legally operate in all regions we were, have presence. This represents a challenge because the technological infrastructure is dispersed among our, our regions that we operate and the data is not physical. One example of this situation is that the services provided by Mercado Livre require support of a technological infrastructure such, such as services and cloud services, which may be owned or provided by third parties. To complicate, in Latin America, we have specific data privacy regulations in places where Mercado Livre operated, for example, Costa Rica, Mexico, Ecuador, Argentina, Uruguay, Chile, Colombia, and Brazil. Uh, in addition to these specific regulations, we also have a specific data protection authorities that we are subject to. These scenarios bring us one big, uh, one big duty to cons that consists in maintaining high transparency standards. To ensure that, we explain how Mercado Livre treats data in our privacy statement, including international data transfers. We need to develop a global strategy that comprises all region and apply locally. To face the challenge involves, we need to elaborate an internal data transfer policies that provide certainty by means of clear and transparent guidelines pre-approved by our local DPOs. I'm a local DPO for Brazilian. Guidelines that are easy to adopt and implement by controllers and processor operators are popular, which means generally adopted and commonly used by among other players in the same business and flexible by providing some guidance to face situations proactively in the daily basis. Having said that about our general guidelines that incorporate our data transfer policies, most of the data transfers are based on contractual clauses, generally accepted by many regions. In Mercado Livre, the contractual clauses are revised and adapted for each region, which means 18 countries. The main goal is allow international data transfers to company in the group and the services providers. Due to specific regulations that we are subject in Latin America, we need to observe some particularities such as the necessity to inform the location of the data storage, the data processing, and the identity of the third party services provides among others that we form in the data subject privacy statement. On the other hand, we'd like to highlight that Mexico cross-border transfers to third countries that not require that the subject consent when made between companies that the same group that operated under uh, that operate under the internal process and policies. Colombia has a white list of trusted geographics allowing cross-border data flow to these nations. DPA uh, in Argentina has a standard model clauses for data transfer. Uh, and we are looking forward to see what Brazilian TPA recommendation will be. Well, to, to finalize and summarize my, my speak here, um, why the practical, uh, what are the practical aspects of dealing with the international data transfer? Why SCC clauses? 
Well, SSE enables free data flow according, uh, in accordance with regulations and appropriate safeguards, enforceable rights of subjects and effective legal remedies. On the other hand, we need to SEC be flexible, simple, harmonized, balanced, collaborative to achieve uh, the legally transferred data in the region. All these uh, adjectives is quite difficult to implement in the practical, but we hope that soon we can have um, some HG uh, Ibero-American or the Dados can contribute that we can harmonize this in region and make my ease, my life a little bit easy when uh, writing all of these SEC clauses. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Samantha. Uh, it's good to hear that uh, you're already capably dealing with this complexity, but also to, to hear the call for uh, regional cooperation, echoing also a little bit of what Miriam was saying. Uh, indeed, uh, the effort that you mentioned uh, of the model uh, contractual clauses uh, by the uh, Inter-American uh, Data Protection Network is the most important effort in the region at the moment uh, in trying to harmonize uh, or uh, offer an, an instrument that facilitates uh, multi-jurisdictional uh, streamlining. Uh, so in this regard, uh, we have actually with us um, Pablo Palazzi, was mentioned by Miriam earlier, he was one of the leading contributors, the leading expert that weighed in uh, in the uh, elaboration of these uh, contractual clauses. And uh, uh, so Pablo is a partner at um, uh, Allende Embrea in Buenos Aires, uh, where he focuses on technology law and is also an adjoint professor at the University of San Andres. Uh, so Pablo, uh, we would like to hear from you, if possible, a little bit about this experience and also how it connects the, or, or it is in any way related or inspired by uh, the EU uh, standard contractual clauses. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolo. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> it's an honor to share with you the floor with all my colleagues, distinguished colleague who has been speaking before. I'm happy to be here. Last time I was speaking in a C CPDP conference was, I think, two years ago. And I remember that in the panel uh, from Brazil was Danilo Doneda, who is a, was a very good friend, and he has left us, but I want to remember him because he was also working with the DPA of Brazil um, before he passed away on the International Town First uh, Protocol. So I remember he told us about that. So we'll, I'd like to remember him. Um, I'm going back to the topic. Um, the topic that concerns us is a very hot topic. As you know, international data transfers are very much in fashion today. It's one of the most important subjects in data privacy. Um, because of several reasons, basically because internet commerce, as uh, the Chilean representative said, is uh, all around and we use a lot of internet connections. And, and specifically, there has been a series of cases, the case Gen 1, Gen 2, the recent meta decision last Monday. Uh, so um, every time I open my internet connection and try to see some data protection news, there's always something about international data transfer. So that's showing how important the topic is for, for, for today. And, with respect to, to the to the SEC for Latin America, um, before the Red Iberoamericana Protection Data decided to do a model, there was no one, on, no model, only Argentina has a model approved in 2016, which was based in the old Data Protection Directive of 1995. Uh, when, the, when the Colombian uh, director Nelson Remolina was in charge of the Red Iberoamericana presidency of Colombia, he decided that we have to do something to harmonize and he proposed this idea and the Red Iberoamericana started to work and I helped them, as, as you can uh, said. And uh, the Red Iberoamericana decided to do this because uh, already Europe has updated uh, the SECs for the European Union based on GDPR. Uh, on, I think it was, this was on June 2021 and there was a need to have in Latin America a tool that will let companies and public institutions to transfer data with, with some safeguards. And so the whole idea was to follow the structure of the uh, European Union standard contractual clauses, but the substantive uh, articles of the SECs of Latin America are based 
on what is called the Standards Iberoamericanos de Protección de Datos, which is uh, a document which is soft law and that was developed by Red Iberoamericana after GDPR went into effect. The whole idea was to create a document that would represent at the same time what you find in Latin American laws, but also uh, the new principles that were introduced both by Convention 18 plus and by the GDPR. And that, that is the result called Standards Iberoamericanos, which is, which is soft law, but it's still uh, like a standard that all Latin American countries will, will like to have if they don't have, or in the case of other countries that already have a, a new law, well, they, they don't need to achieve that. And, and the SECs, of course, are based on the same structure. So we, you find a docking clause, which is a clause allowing other companies to join in. Uh, we have all the principles of data privacy introduced in the SECs. Uh, we have the typical things that you find, you find in contracts. And, and I'd like to stop a bit and talk about the advantages of using SECs, uh, which is uh, the following issues. First, you know that contract is all around the world. A contract is a tool that has been used in Roman law. All the, all the countries can accept contracts. All Latin American countries accept a principle called third party beneficiary, which means that a person who has not signed the agreement is protected or benefit from an agreement. In this case, the third party beneficiary is um, the data subject who is protected by the, on, by the transfer, by the two companies signing the, the agreement. And, and what is important is that all Latin American countries accept in their civil codes third party beneficiary. This is explained in the guide that comes with the SECs. And, uh, another important issue is that um, SECs are ready to use tool of the shelf, so any company can just use it, but, but by applying it, uh, they save cost, they save time in negotiating a new agreement, uh, it's pre-approved. Uh, there's an issue of implementation. The, the implementation of the SECs in Latin America has been implemented by Peru last year, also recommended by the Uruguayan Data Protection Agency as a recommendation. And Argentina is working on the DPF Argentina on amending its uh, disposition 60 to recommend it also as a, an alternative to the current SEC issues by Argentina. Um, at the other time, I, I would like to add that apart from the SECs in Latin America, the Council of Europe is working in SECs for Convention 108 plus. So this will bring uh, under the table another set of um, standard contractor clauses apart from the ones in the European Union and apart from the one in Latin America, which are the one that we will apply to countries who sign in with Convention 108 plus. Um, so uh, this brings us to the idea of interoperability or trying to, to, to have bridges between all these kinds of SECs, as uh, I think Miriam mentioned. And, and, we, and we, we will need to discuss probably after we have all these standard contractor clauses what they are really standard, what are the difference between them, and, and how, how we can make some convergence um, so we can make more interoperability between Latin America, Europe, Asia, and the rest of, um, and, and the, rest of the world. Uh, so this is a very brief explanation, but I'm open to questions or to comments in the next part of the session. Thank you very much. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Pablo. Uh, indeed, uh, I think it's important that you show that uh, despite uh, the European influence, that which is clear from the similarity between the two, there is a lot coming uh, directly from the specific cities of these different jurisdictions. Uh, so we have uh, a diverse set of laws and degree of maturity of uh, uh, the various countries in, in the region. Uh, and uh, I think it was a very remarkable effort that you managed to uh, pull out uh, principles uh, that accommodate, you know, this complexity uh, and at the same time provide some interoperability. Uh, so at this point, I think uh, uh, you mentioned bridges. I think it's, it's good to make a bridge between uh, uh, Latin America and Brussels to make it uh, more physical and move to our next speaker, <laughs> who is uh, Alisa Weckemann. Uh, she is uh, a member of the International uh, Data Flows uh, Unit of the European Commission. Uh, where she co-led uh, the modernization uh, of standard contract clauses and also is in charge of uh, reviewing uh, the adequacy framework uh, for uh, Uruguay and Argentina. And uh, 
uh, she, uh, I think, can talk to us a little bit about uh, her view about uh, flows, data flows between uh, European Union uh, or Europe and uh, Latin America, uh, particularly bearing in mind all that we are seeing. So these developments of different uh, contractual clauses, uh, as well as uh, the SRAMS 2 judgment uh, and its application recently in the meta transfer decision. Um, so Aliza, thank you very much. You have the floor. Thank you very much uh, and good evening everyone. Um, Yes, I think everything that we've heard so far, I think that very clearly shows that uh, the EU and, and Latin America are really uh, natural partners to, to cooperate on, on data protection and, and on data flows. Uh, I think it's, it's clear that the, the approach that we have to, to privacy in the EU and in Latin America and, and to data protection is very similar. Um, I mean, in, in both regions, privacy and, and data protection are recognized as fundamental rights that are constitutionally protected. Uh, I think in Latin America, I think on top of that, you even have the habeas data, which is, again, constitutional uh, protection of, of certain rights for individuals to then obtain access to their data. Um, I think um, this approach is then also reflected in specific uh, privacy legislation. I mean, we've heard very interesting remarks about uh, Chile, and we've, see, we've, seen, no, we've also heard that in, in Brazil very recently, um, there's been a new law, which I think indeed has, is very similar to what we have uh, in the EU. Um, and I think beyond that, we have a, a similar approach to, to fundamental rights uh, protection, including uh, protecting individuals against interferences from public authorities. I mean, you mentioned the, the Schrems II judgment. Uh, of course, in, in the EU, this has indeed been a very important judgment from our Court of Justice that, that clarified the, the standard that we need to meet, uh, the Commission needs to meet to adopt an adequacy decision and has also further clarified the conditions under which other transfer tools can be used, such as uh, standard contractual clauses. So basically, uh, the court has clarified that companies also have to assess uh, the legal framework in a third country where the data importer is based uh, to determine whether there's anything there that could prevent the importer from complying, including, for instance, uh, disproportionate access to data by, by public authorities, for example, intelligence agencies. Uh, and, and for this assessment, basically what the commission has to do, but also what companies have to look at is whether certain fundamental uh, principles exist, so whether there are limitations and safeguards uh, to ensure that access to data is limited to what is necessary and proportionate, uh, and whether effective remedies are available. So, and I think, again, this is an area where there's a very similar approach uh, in Europe and, and in Latin America. I mean. Uh, in, in most Latin American countries, and the principles of necessity and proportionality are also enshrined uh, in the Constitution. Uh, there are some other requirements, for, for instance, a requirement to obtain a judicial warrant in order to, to access data. Uh, there are general requirements or uh, redress uh, possibilities, including the possibility to, to go to court for individuals. Uh, so these are, of course, all, I think, very relevant elements, uh, both for the Commission when we do an adequacy assessment, but also for companies uh, that want to transfer data to uh, Latin America from Europe. So I think against that background, given the, the commonalities that we have uh, in these different areas, there are really a lot of opportunities for uh, very concrete cooperation. I mean, with some countries like uh, Uruguay and Argentina, uh, the EU has a, a long-standing cooperation. We've had adequacy decisions uh, for those countries for, for a long time. Uh, as was already mentioned, at the moment we are in, in adequacy talks with Brazil, and there are also very close contacts with a number of other countries in the region. I think Chile is also uh, a good example of that. Um, another area where we see a lot of potential for cooperation is precisely on model contractual clauses. I mean, a lot was already said about this, this tool. Also in the EU, we, we, had, uh, we have model clauses. They were modernized in uh, 2021, and they are in practice the tool that is used the most. Uh, so we find it very interesting to see that uh, there's a very similar development also in Latin America. I mean, Argentina was already mentioned that has uh, had model clauses uh, as a transfer tool for, for a while, but of course with the, the clauses that have been developed by the Ibero Ibero-American network, we've seen more and more countries that are starting to use this. Uh, for example, Peru that has incorporated this in, in its legal framework. And we think that this, this tool has the potential not only to facilitate data transfers within the Latin American region, but also between Latin America and other regions that have similar tools. So the EU, but for instance, also ASEAN, uh, who has also developed uh, model clauses. 
Um, and just a last few words on this. I mean, we are particularly interested in, in working together on, on model clauses because we see that the, the Ibero-American network clauses are very similar to the ones that we have uh, under the GDPR. And I think this also creates opportunities to perhaps work together to see whether there are ways to uh, further develop that bridge, as, as you also said, uh, to see how we could make it easier for companies that are operating in both regions to use these different set of clauses by providing guidance, uh, identifying best practices, and making it easier for them to, to comply with these two sets of uh, clauses. Um, so, yeah, I think we see a lot of opportunities for, for cooperation. I could go on, I think, uh, about regulatory cooperation and other areas, but I think we're also running out of time, so I will stop here, but uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aliza. Yes, indeed, we cannot do justice to the complexity of this topic. Uh, you know, we have just very limited amount of time, but I'm happy to, to uh, hear all these different perspectives. I think it's important just to bring them to the floor. Uh, and uh, hear the prospects of uh, future cooperation. It was good to hear that you are optimistic and hopeful about uh, you know, the prospects of uh, data flows between uh, EU and uh, Latin America. And uh, uh, indeed, uh, this is uh, one part of the picture. However, at the same time, I, I want to highlight now uh, a second aspect of data flows, which is the trade law aspect. Uh, and, and that's something that we have seen you know, in the negotiations of uh, WTO, um, an e-commerce agreement. Uh, now it, the uh, discussions are also taking place in bilateral agreements and regional agreements uh, regarding you know, the free flow of data with some limitations. And so uh, it's particularly good and interesting for us to have a speaker uh, that has undertook a, a comparative research of all the uh, e-commerce and data-related uh, provisions in these trade agreements, and is joining us uh, from uh, the WTI Institute, the World Trade Institute in Bern. Uh, his name is Rodrigo Polanco. Uh, he was also, just to close the loop with our first speaker, he's from Chile, and he was uh, uh, consulted as part of the um, drafting process of this uh, data protection bill. Uh, and uh, yes, so we would like to hear from you, um, Rodrigo, if you could tell us a little bit about uh, this uh, trade approach to uh, data flows, uh, you know, if they bring uh, complexity uh, and, uh, and, you know, what was your assessment after having conducted this empirical analysis? So, Rodrigo, thank you very much for accepting the invitation and you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Nicolo. Uh, thank you very much for, for the invitation. Um, uh, as, as you mentioned, I come from the trade side, so my take is going to be a little bit maybe less optimistic uh, than, than you all have had uh, here, um, because uh, there are rules that have been uh, made uh, elsewhere and uh, not um, in domestically in countries, and these rules, they have a, a different impact in what countries want to take, uh, want to do concerning digital trade. Uh, just, just to be not to sh tell you about numbers. Uh, let me show you some few slides, just so you I don't bore you with numbers. Um, so, as you mentioned, there are discussions at WTO about the regulation of digital trade, but those discussions haven't been so far, and it's highly unlikely that these discussions are going to succeed uh, in in the short term. What is happening in the meantime that you have a uh, a number of uh, preferential trade agreements, or not most of them free trade agreements, where there is a regulation of uh, this topic. Um, and Latin America has had a very important participation in these agreements. Um, from uh, uh, around 300 agreements that they have the provisions on electronic commerce and data transfer, um, Latin America has uh, concluded 126 that include provisions that they are relevant to the topic and specifically with chapters and, and, and provisions directed to e-commerce and data transfers, 41 chapters and 50 agreements. Um, from these agreements, you have 26, they concluded with developed countries and 24 with developing countries, as you can see on the slides. And the leading countries in this trend are Chile, Colombia, Peru, Panama, and Costa Rica. Um, there is a lot of, um, I would say, common uh, trends in these uh, treaties. They include, when it comes to e-commerce, digital tra uh, trade, 
certain common objectives and principles like facilitating e-commerce, avoiding unnecessary barriers, addressing the needs of uh, SMEs, uh, the application of WTO rules when they are applicable, basically um, not, to, not to increase the number of restrictions, non-discrimination, national treatment, most favored nation, recognizing electronic authentication, um, a custom uh, duties moratorium on, on digital uh, uh, services and digital products, and uh, some provisions of the protection of, on source code. The level of legalization of these provisions is, is very different across the PTAs. Some of these provisions are, are binding, like for example, the, the custom duties moratorium, and some are more soft, like principles. Another set of provisions that you find in this agreement that is pertinent for this conference are the protections, uh, the, pro the provisions on protection of personal data, free flow of data, and data localization. Uh, I don't, I don't want to bore you with with all the, the details, but the important thing to know is that these trade agreements they include provisions concerning the protection of personal data, free flow of data, and data localization. Um, the provisions on the protection of personal data they are most more or less soft or best effort provisions up to now. Uh, when, but uh, the ones uh, concerning free flow of data and data localization, they are most of them binding, meaning that uh, there is a, a hard commitments on, on the, the cross-border transfer of, of data. And, uh, and in the case of data localization, uh, commitment, strict commitments uh, that of countries, for example, they cannot require a person to use or to locate computing facilities in, in, in the territory of that country uh, in order to uh, authorize uh, the business in that, in that territory. So as you can see, countries that they are doing domestic policies on this, they not necessarily have a blank page in front of them. They have international commitments that they have concluded most of them in bilateral uh, treaties. And these commitments, they have some rules. Uh, uh, certain of them, uh, they are uh, hard and binding, and some of them, they are soft. But for what it matters in this uh, conference, the ones connected to free flow of data and data localization are mostly of binding nature. So, so the question here is uh, uh, that uh, Latin America has some, some challenges uh, on the implementation of these agreements. The first one is that even though there is a lot of commonality on the principles I mentioned before, when it comes to e-commerce and digital trade, there is not much uh, uh, clarity about how far these countries go uh, concerning implementation. And on the other hand, uh, national regulations on a specific topics uh, on, on these agreements, particularly on data protection, they lag behind to the commitments that these countries have concluded in, in these uh, trade agreements. So for example, uh, except for Costa Rica, uh, according to, to several studies, uh, most Latin American countries that they are leading the conclusions of these agreements have moderate to significant digital trade restrictions at the domestic level. So that could be implied as some clash between the domestic regulation and the international commitments. Uh, Concerning data protection, uh, some countries have moderate uh, or limited uh, data protection. In the case of Chile, it's going to be a change soon, but still is uh, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, and Panama, they have a limited data protection. Uh, in the case of Panama, they didn't even have a data protection law. So my, to conclude here is that this, this uh, contradiction or this uh, uh, gap or, or la lack of communication between domestic regulation and international regulation can create uh, a problem. Uh, for example, what would happen if uh, a country wants to adapt to, to GDPR uh, or to other similar uh, regulations, and these, uh, these countries have commitments in treaties that they say that they shall not impose restrictions on, on transfer of information greater than are required to achieve their objectives. Who is gonna who is gonna judge that uh, the dispute settlement mechanism of the trade agreement or not? Um, and then some some lingering questions here. Uh, the first one is that uh, why Latin American countries are doing this? Uh, they are other uh, these countries out of doing that out of a necessity uh, or to be rule makers or or to pressure domestic reform. Um, we see that uh, there is a lot of commonality now at domestic level with what the EU is doing and, and Latin American countries. 
but they use not the only one uh, relevant here. We have uh, China with a different take on, on data protection and the US with a different take on data protection. So we need to think about that too when it comes to the compatibility of our systems. So but I will leave it there and thank you again for the invitation and uh, it has been great to, to hear and, and, and learn from you. Thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo, for this very clear overview. And I think you highlighted very well uh, uh, this tension uh, between what is being done uh, maybe domestically in the data protection sphere and uh, you know, what, what is being negotiated abroad. Uh, sometimes we see uh, uh, also uh, governments that kind of tie their ends up, uh, they cannot uh, you know, undertake certain reforms because they have taken certain international uh, commitments. Uh, there's also a discussion and criticism from civil society that is not participating enough in these trade negotiations and therefore it, uh, the perspective is not being brought to, uh, to, to the fore as it is in the data protection context. Um, so at this point, I think we have heard uh, a lot of perspective. Uh, this last intervention in particular has spiced it up a little bit. Um, and uh, I, I would like to now uh, open the floor for anybody who um, has a question or comment about uh, the interaction of these different frameworks. Um, so yeah, I see Alessandro Mantelero. Uh, please. Thank you. So, primero, enhorabuena a Chile por terminar el trabajo sobre protección de datos. Yo he tenido la oportunidad de de estar en Santiago años atrás, en el principio, en la universidad, discutiendo de este tema, so, muy bien. Y, moving to, to, to English, and also moving to the topic of discussion, uh, regardless a brief comment about the fact that China cannot be a model in data protection, if you consider data protection a fundamental rights. And this is, I think, something that we have to stress. There are many models, but not all the models are consistent with the fundamental rights framework. Um, but uh, I think that we discuss a lot about uh, the models uh, uh, for the transfer. Uh, the models and transfer are very crucial and are very technical and part of the technicalities. Uh, Pablo make a, a great work in this sense and also many other experts in this, in this field. But beyond the technicalities, uh, there is the problem of what there is on the ground. So what it means? It means that it's not enough to have good uh, uh, bridges, good closes, but we need also strong uh, implementation of data protection laws. And so I, I lead to the, to the question. So there are two models, uh, the golden standard that is uh, data protection and GDPR, and there's the global standard that probably is more close to Convention 108. But the real problem is how these models are implemented in each country. And in this line is very important the role of the independence of data protection authorities, because are the data protection authorities that at the end of the day have to monitor the level of implementation of the law. So we cannot imagine to rely only on these tools that are contractual tools if we miss the point of the important role of the independence and effective uh, funds and activities of the data protection authority. Because if not, this remains only on paper. And this is not good for Europe, it's not good for Latin America. And so I, I would like to have some comments from the speakers about how we can be an effective implementation of these uh, models and clauses through the enforcement of data protection authorities' role in uh, data protection law in Latin America. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Um, so unless we have other questions, I would uh, just uh, maybe ask uh, also the speakers to comment to not only on these questions, but also since we are approaching uh, time, um, just give their view on uh, what they see as promising, you know, in terms of facilitating an interoperable uh, and harmonizing approach to data transfers. Uh, you know, we have heard that there are many different efforts. Uh, by, uh, it has been mentioned, OECD, uh, Council of Europe, uh, 
uh, Ibero-American Network, European Commission, even the uh, G7 and G20 have made statements on data transfers, uh, and then we have the trade negotiations. So considering all this, like what do you see, uh, in addition to the important point of data protection being respected on the ground, uh, what do you see as the most promising uh, developments or avenues for uh, interoperability, legal interoperability between these different frameworks? Uh, so uh, we can have a closing round uh, from each speaker. Uh, maybe we can start from uh, uh, the order that we started. Uh, so the first one uh, would be Miriam. Um, thank you so much, Nicolo, and thank you, Alessandro, for the question. It's lovely hearing you again. Um, I, I think a, a number of issues were raised, and I think I'd like to briefly touch upon uh, something that was uh, mentioned by Rodrigo as he was discussing trade agreements. And I, and I would say that from my own experience as a civil servant in Brazil over 16 years, I have at many, many different moments been um, consulted as to propose negotiations and trade agreements when I worked at the Ministry of Science and Technology or the Ministry of Communications. And the feeling I have, echoing a bit what Rodrigo was saying, is that, is that these trade agreements are slowly beginning to um, increase their scope to include issues that were traditionally discussed in other venues, such as internet governance issues, personal data protection issues. So. I think five or six years ago, I began seeing trade agreements discussing network neutrality, data localization, um, free flow of, of, of data across borders with trust, you know, kinds of language that were not traditionally contained in these agreements. And that on the other hand, uh, I think brought a lot of complexity because typically the negotiators of trade agreements are not the same people who are going to internet governance discussions or to data protection discussions. So uh, I, I feel instinctively that Rodrigo is quite correct in his assessment. And I would say that this is also a challenge in, in countries, in a country like Brazil, where we still have a new legislation that is not yet widely understood or even widely known, um, to include different stakeholders in this discussion. And of course, I'm speaking about data protection authorities, but also, as you were mentioning, Professor Nicolo, um, civil society, because these are typically discussions held behind closed doors, while data protection and internet governance discussions are most often conducted in a multi-stakeholder, bottom-up fashion, which I think is a quite contrasting approach. So just a comment upon that, because I think it's a really interesting and valid point and certainly something to be considered not only by diplomats at the ministries of foreign affairs, but also within data protection authorities to understand the impacts of discussions on SECs, BCRs, and adequacy decisions. So I think that was a great point. Um, and coming to Alessandro's question, um, I fully agree that independence is a key aspect. Um, independence and the capacity to effectively enforce these mechanisms, even if data is not stored locally, the same level of protections must apply. And, and I would say that independence is key, but there are other issues, I think, also related to global cooperation, which are easier said than done. So international cooperation, interoperability, harmonization, all these concepts are great. But I do have the feeling that it's important for us to aim to take the next step towards more effective, coordinated enforcement mechanisms, for instance, and I'd like to mention that within the Ibero-American Network of Data Protection Authorities, um, we have, I think, begun very, very, very slowly moving towards coordinated enforcement mechanisms in terms of exchanging information, trying to align our approaches. And when we are dealing with companies that are transnational in, in nature, that span over multiple jurisdictions, I think it becomes even clearer the importance of coordination and, and exchange of notes and building a relationship of trust between DPAs in order to allow us to more effectively um, bring enforcement and, and compliance with our legislation. So I'd, I'd like to leave it at that. And thank you very much once again, Nicola, for the invitation. Thank you very much, Miriam. In the interest of time, uh, let's move directly to the next uh, speaker. We have uh, five minutes, but we started also a little bit late, so we can stretch it a little bit. Uh, but yes, uh, Samantha, please, oh. your comments. Thanks, Nico. Uh, I couldn't agree more with Alessandro and Miriam uh, from a perspective um, side of view of the, the private company. Uh, if we have a cooperate between DPAs and we have a harmonized clauses in the region, we'll be very facilitated to implement and achieve the goal, the goal, which is transparency, adequacy, and all of that. 
in data flows and data transfers. So um, I think it, I, I couldn't agree more with everything that was said in here in this panel. Uh, the technology is it's just one and we need to cooperate and facilitate the harmonizations in the region for, for sure. And thanks once again for being in this panel. I'm very happy. Thank you, Samantha. Uh, now, the, the third speaker I have on the list is Pablo. Pablo, do you want to react, uh, comment on anything we, we said? Yeah, just a very quick quick mention that probably one of the key elements of what we may call data protection 3.0, which will be like third generation data protection law, will be the need to strengthen cooperation between DPAs at regional level and international level. That's already happening. We've seen DPAs are acting together in terms of inter artificial intelligence in Latin America. And, and it's good to see them working together because data flows are all around the world and, and you cannot just take an isolated view. Uh, I also like to add, uh, to answer a bit, Professor Alessandro Mantelero question that independence of the DPAs is key, but it's very difficult. One thing is to have it on paper saying that they have to be independent, autonomous, blah, blah, blah. But then on practice in Latin America, uh, with certain difficulties in democracies, you see, you see that independence is difficult. I, I like to put the example of Mexico, which is currently having a problem between the executive power and the INAI or DPA, which basically the Senate is not naming members. So the DPA of Mexico cannot operate uh, until they have full, full members nominated. And, and that's a good example of uh, political issues that can arise in a country. I'm putting Mexico because it's the most recent example. Like I can mention Argentina. In Argentina, the law was approved in 2000 and the president vetoed the law and changed the, the the DPA and took it from the independence and put it within the Ministry of Justice. So and that's something happening in our neighbor countries of Argentina. So uh, having independence of DPAs is something very difficult in democracies which are still striving to be democracies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. Now let's move to our physical speaker, uh, Alisa. So I will be very quick because I'm seeing the signs that we have to stop. Uh, no, I just want to, 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 I think it's very similar and I, I very much agree with, uh, with, with the question or the, the point that was made. I think in the EU we have seen this very much with uh, our standard contractual clauses. I mean, as I said, they've been around for around 20 years, but up until very recently they were very often just signed, put in a drawer and never looked at again. I think this has changed or is slowly changing. I think one element here is indeed the fact that the, with the GDPR, uh, a lot of DPAs uh, became more independent and gained more powers. I think that was one aspect. Another aspect was, of course, uh, the case law, the Schrems II judgment that was already mentioned, which drew a lot of attention to this. Now we're also seeing first enforcement action, you know, the meta case. Um, but I think this indeed shows the, the important role that, that regulators have here to make sure that these things are actually also implemented and are not just remain something on paper. Um, I think this is very much true, not just for, for, for within Europe, but since companies are operating across borders and very often uh, data protection breaches or security breaches can affect individuals in a number of jurisdictions, indeed the importance of cooperation between regulators in Europe, but in this case in Latin America, is becoming also more and more important. And we really think that this is something for, for the next years that, that we should focus on, on, on strengthening between individual regulators. And it comes from, it goes from exchanging information to really enforcement cooperation, joint enforcement action uh, between individual regulators, but perhaps there's also room for cooperation between different networks, so the European Data Protection Board and the Ibero-American uh, network. Thank you. Perfect. And finally, just uh, Rodrigo, wondering if you have any optimistic or positive notes. You know, you gave us a lot of uh, yeah, skepticism from the trade law side. Yeah, I, I just, well, just, I think it's a very good, the question was uh, very uh, good. I think uh, as a suggestion, um, I think there would be, a, uh, it would be good to have more exchange uh, of experiences between uh, agencies, uh, um, but not only about success stories, but also what is not working in a way of trying to improve uh, um, uh, what the, uh, the implementation of the laws and these commitments in the countries. And last but not least, as Miriam mentioned, improved communication between trade people and data uh, protection people. I think this is missing a lot. And that's why I'm very thankful of having this possibility of, of discussing with you. 
Indeed. Uh, so we will continue this discussion in the next years. Uh, what I hear is, you know, the need for cooperation between networks, between uh, uh, departments, you know, that do uh, related things. Uh, and uh, we, we hope to facilitate that discussion uh, moving forward. Uh, you know, next year, I already promise we will have another panel dedicated to uh, Latin American uh, data transfers. And I uh, uh, want to close also by uh, acknowledging the work that was done, uh, as uh, Pablo mentioned, by Danilo Doneda in uh, helping us uh, establish the CPDP LATAM and uh, actively uh, bridging you know, the uh, European uh, context, the European uh, discussions with the Latin American ones. Uh, for those of you who did not know him, uh, you can find uh, a page in the booklet, uh, I think it's page 63, uh, which uh, has some words of, uh, you know, acknowledgement and th uh, thanking note uh, for what he has done. So uh, maybe uh, I just want to uh, dedicate this session to him. Uh, he was a dear friend and a great colleague. Uh, thank you very much to everybody, and uh, uh, you can now uh, enjoy the drinks, and uh, see you next year. <laughs>